Hey, how are you all doing? My next special guest is Janine. Uh, you already know her from the previous episodes. Last one I had with together with Janine von Jan. Uh, fantastic discussion. Uh, listen to it if you haven't yet. So Janine is, uh, you can find her on Twitter, j 9 Rome. I'm going to put her in show notes. She writes a fantastic blog. Of, uh, she's an investigative journalist focused on privacy and, and a lot of other uh, aspects and, and topics. And she puts out great content on uh, Block Digest and Pan Opticast. So yeah, check out her, her website, her blog, uh, follow her on Twitter. So we're going to talk about strike, uh, Jack Mahler's strike. What does it mean for the space? What does it mean in terms of privacy? Um, what kind of alternatives are there to WhatsApp, Telegram, you know, all those, you know, usual uh, normal applications that millions, maybe even billions of people use? What other alternatives are there? We're going to about, talk about, you know, the current development situation in the United States, in the European Union, the funny business statements by uh, Christine Lagarde. So without further ado, this is my talk with Janine. Hope you're going to love this as much as I do. Please give it a like, retweet, share, whatever you do. It really helps the algorithm. And um, please uh, give it a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and thanks so much for your support. And here you go, my interview with Janine. Hey, Janine, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin show. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing pretty well. It's uh, well, we're getting to that part of the year where it's getting lighter every day instead of darker. So that's good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, besides my, um, you know, sleepless nights with our baby, our baby is, you know, she's, she's all well, you know, she's healthy and, and beautiful and uh, and she's super brave and, and and very peaceful. But sometimes, you know, like last night was pretty sleepless nights we all had. So, yeah, I guess we got to all get used to that. <laughs> so, Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janine. Um, listen, I mean, you've been putting out so much content. It's become overwhelming. I'm just, you know, empathizing with the average, you know, again, user person out there. So, you know, since you are very focused, you know, you're investigative journalists, you've, you've put up so much great content on, on your blog site, on your newsletter, which I, you know, read, of course, uh, I think the last one you published was in uh, December, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, and then of course your interviews were awesome on, on this new series by Metadel and Marky Band, right? With a, a Citadel Dispatch. Uh, yeah, I think I think Citadel Dispatch is only Matt. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, he, uh, he spun it off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where the focus, you know, it's I... still on there. Yeah, it's still on the TFTC channel, but I think it's only Matt. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So look, I have a. Um, let me. Yeah, I have a couple of, of topics. Of course, want to you know dig deeper into, you know, and in, in listen to your uh, thoughts and, and your opinions and your perspectives. And, uh, of and definitely, you know, we I want to talk to you about privacy and, you know, the, the very normal things with people use like WhatsApp and Telegram, because, uh, you've done some nuanced, uh, explanations that, you know, it's not as, <laughs> as, as, as secure or private as it seems sometimes. And now that WhatsApp has also, every time I, you know, I, I open up my WhatsApp, there's this sort of, I'm, I'm being asked to confirm like the new terms and conditions. And I'm like, not now, not now, you know, so maybe you can go into that a little bit, but let's just first, I want to talk to you about strike. Um, cause I've been trying, you know, to get a, get a hold of, uh, of Jack Mollis. I know he's very busy, but the things he's just putting out, it's just mind blowing. Uh, I think it's, it's finally the cat is out of the bag and the, what do you call it? The swift financial banking remittance, uh, <laughs> corporate complex, uh, could become obsolete with that. What's your opinion on that? How do you see that? What, is, what does strike mean now, now that it's gone into, you know, full blown action, and the only thing that uh, is that we cannot download it still in the European Union or I guess in other countries too, but I, I guess it's not going to take too long until we can download it and use it too. So what, what is your take on that? And then, let me, then later on, I'm, I'm, I want to ask you about like, 
what are the privacy, what could be the privacy, the potential privacy concerns, and could there be anonymous transactions, like as if you, as if you were paying cash with, you know, with, uh, with minimum or maximum threshold of amounts. Not just go, you know, step by step. Uh, what is your take on, on Strike? Yeah, so for anyone who doesn't know, Strike is basically an app that allows you um, to send a Bitcoin transaction. And in Strike's case, it uses Lightning as much as possible. So you can send a Bitcoin transaction that on the other end, once it goes through Strike, it gets um, sent into someone's bank account as fiat. And so far up until this point, it's only uh, used the US dollar. And I'm actually, I was under the impression that it does work in Europe. I've seen a few people who live um, in Europe install it. So I'm not sure if maybe it's limited to certain countries or maybe it's not fully up yet in Europe, um, but it should be available. I think it launched in Europe in the last two weeks or so. Um, I signed yeah, up, and maybe also can... well, or maybe it's a sign up process. I have, we have to wait for early access. Maybe that's why. Uh, so it's, maybe it takes a while until they can scale it yeah. up. Okay. Yeah, it could be. I, I don't I don't know the reason. All I know is that he he has recently moved into the European Union, so it should be available to some degree to people in Europe. But um, you, again, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, you can also do the opposite. You can send uh, it. The main use case uh, when I heard he was developing it was basically that it was a way for people who wanted to get paid in Bitcoin but didn't have an employer or employers if they're freelance who would be able to pay in Bitcoin. So it would be a way for employers to pay them in fiat, but it would arrive in their account as Bitcoin. And I thought that that was a pretty great use case. Um, uh, Strike at, in general as an app, um, I mean, I see a lot of people installing it and I think the scope of things that it wants to do for people has expanded a lot beyond that. I mean, we had an, an, a well-known NFL player in the Bitcoin space um, say that he was now going to get a large, I think half of his salary now in Bitcoin and he was going to be using Strike. And on one hand, I think it's great to, you know, this is this is another onboarding tool and it seems to have a very good user experience um, for the average person. So, you know, if, if your goal is to get as many people into Bitcoin as possible, that's, uh, I think this is a great option for that. Um, personally, it's not something for me um, as a user because I am very conscious about privacy, uh, as, as you said, and when uh, up, up until the launch of Strike, um, there was some marketing about how it was KYC light. And there's not really ever been a clear definition of what KYC light means, but the way that I've always understood it and kind of used it is that it's a service that technically it collects personal identifying information, not necessarily for KYC purposes explicitly, but it collects personal identifying information um, that, you know, if you use the app, you could be giving it real information about yourself, like your name and your email address that you use for everything and things like that. But um, with the application itself, there's no strict policy that you have to actually identify yourself with your legal name and such. And so you have this option to spoof. You have the option to use a pseudonym and either the service um, maybe it, it is okay with people using pseudonyms, so it doesn't it doesn't care whether you do that or the collection that it does. Um, they they don't they don't use it for strict KYC purposes, and so they're not actually checking to see if you're a real person if you use a fake name. So that's what I always considered KYC light. So when I heard that Strike was KYC light, and to be clear, I understand at the point at this point now with all the things that it's doing, I can see why it's not really possible given banking regulations for Strike to be KYC light, actually KYC light. Um, but at the time, given the use case, um, I thought it was, you know, ba basically kind of a hosted lightning wallet that, you know, Strike would be doing this conversion for. And I, saw, I thought it was possible for it to actually be KYC light. Um, but when it launched, I realized, actually, no, it's not KYC Lite. The way that Strike um, interprets KYC Lite is that when you sign up for the app, you don't have to explicitly give them a lot of information. 
Um, but the reason that you're able to do that is because they plug into other services like Plaid, like I can't remember the name of the other one, but there's actually a service that they use that kind of does the KYC for them. They try to check whatever information you give them, um, including if they can't find anything on you, a, they ask explicitly for like a tax ID and things like that. Um, they handle the KYC in the background. They actually try and look for you and information about you in whatever, you know, databases they can find. And unfortunately, because, you know, the amount of privacy that most people have as a baseline is so low because their names and addresses appear in, you know, various, uh, various data broker type websites, uh, also like the white pages, uh, making it easy to find people kind of like a direct, a really bad directory of <laughs> where everyone lives and who they're related to. Um, so unfortunately, services like, services like that are able to function because most people already don't have a lot of privacy. So I personally would not consider that KYC light. I feel like it's more of a, <laughs> it's more of like a, I don't know how to describe it. It's like a very, sneaky way of doing KYC where you're not actually asking people for data and they don't know the full extent of what the service knows about them because the service is getting it from other sources. Um, and mo to be clear, most services that ask uh, for personal information, they, they will try to verify it with other sources, but I, I, I just don't, uh, personally, I just don't appreciate this idea that, you know, if, if we're going to KYC people, they should get you should just ask them for the information they should know that this is what you're giving them and not pretend like we're not doing that in the background um so personally for me it's not something that i would use just because i'm i'm a very privacy conscious person i try to i act i actually still to this day i don't use any kyc exchanges um i've never used any service that requires kyc for cryptocurrency stuff um because uh well, we, we've seen even services that don't do KYC, really. They just, you know, collect information for shipping purposes, you know, not really a KYC thing, just they need to know where to send you a device and also general information about, like, you know, for tax purposes in their country, where they, where they sold devices and how many they sold. Um, Ledger, for example, had their big data breach. That's hundreds of thousands oh of God. people yeah, who are now exactly. potentially yeah. at risk. Yeah. And that's that's a service that doesn't do KYC, so they don't even have the most sensitive information that a lot of services in this space collect for that purpose. And this has nothing to do with whether I trust Jack or his service. I actually think you know if you had to, if you had to choose a uh, if if you had to choose a custodian to dox yourself to um, in this industry, you might as well just go with Strike because uh, I mean, I think Jack and his family are great people. Um, yeah. I would trust them personally. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you're using any kind of FinTech app, which if you're, you know, trading or using exchanges, most of them, if not all of them are probably using Plaid or something like Plaid. Unfortunately, it's pretty ubiquitous. So if you're going to do that kind of thing, you might as well use Strike, but um, if you are like me and you want to avoid those kinds of things, then I would, uh, I would, I cannot personally recommend it for a use case like mine, but yeah. Yeah, you're right. You see, I mean, yeah, I mean, I can only repeat, uh, agree to what you said. I mean, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm a huge proponent and fan of, of, of what Jack Mullers is doing. It's, it's just uh, evolutionary, I think. I think he's really solving a huge problem in this space. He's actually making, I mean, the SWIFT system as good as obsolete. And, you know, this, this intermediaries, the centralized, these, these remittances uh, mafia, <laughs> which I call them. But the thing is, you know, uh, you know, Jack has, uh, his mom has a, has a weed shop, has a cannabis shop. Uh, you know, they sell real weed. But in Austria, for example, my girlfriend has a, has a hemp shop, right? So you cannot sell cannabis like THC, but you can sell plants or whatever. Uh, uh, utensils, uh, but so most people that come there, you know, they prefer to 
purchase their whatever they purchase uh, in cash anonymously, right? So this is, and I and I I told you know my girlfriend about. It. I said hey, this this could be a great thing for just download the app. It's super easy, user friendly, and she would totally do that. But I'm like, and then she the only the only concern she's had, and she's more into actually she's more even concerned than anybody I know about privacy, is that yeah. But what are my client clients going to do? I mean, can they can they purchase you know uh, can they buy and and pay uh, as if they would be you know uh, paying in cash uh, like the rest of the time so and i thought maybe there's a threshold you know like like up to a minimum like really small amounts like people can just pay in cash uh, like anonymously and anything above that like yeah like you know like you uh, you can like with the same thing the same situation with the atm bitcoin atms uh uh, in in Austria, for example, it's like a sort of a voluntary agreement. You know, up to two hundred fifty euro, um, people can just buy Bitcoin anonymously, and anything above that, they you know they need to whatever do a sort of a KYC. So this is the concern I've had, and otherwise, you know, the conceptually and and the, the problem it solves, it's it's amazing, right? So yeah, so I wanted to have sort of a yeah your. Know, as you've already done your nuanced differentiated opinion on this. Yeah, I mean, it. so in that use case, um, I mean, first of all, it's really hard to get the amount of privacy that you have with cash. Um, I mean, if you're operating in a local context and cash is possible for you, then I think, you know, cash, um, cash is probably the best you can get in terms of privacy bitcoin and the privacy that you can get with using like the lightning network for example that's supposed to you know get you as close to um privacy with cash which there's a lot of there's a lot of improvements that can be made with lightning in terms of privacy but um it's supposed to get you as close as possible to you know digital cash privacy as possible at a distance so it's you you can have some privacy when you're not able to physically interact with something like physical cash um so i i wouldn't say that there's any need um if cash is working to go to bitcoin um if if people don't want to use that um though if if she wants to accept bitcoin um I would, yeah, I, it's, it's hard because even though Strike uses the Lightning Network, obviously when you're having people KYC basically at both ends, uh, just because you have the Lightning Network in the middle, that doesn't, uh, <laughs> that, that doesn't really do anything for you in terms of privacy, um, except for, you know, the actual payment details are still, uh, well, to some degree, the, the, the Bitcoin part of it is, uh, somewhat offline still, but yeah, um, it's difficult. And yeah, so Jack works on, before he worked on Strike, he made Zap, which is a non-custodial lightning wallet. And that has uh, all of the regular privacy guarantees that come with the lightning network. Um, but it doesn't have, you know, any anything that interacts with fiat gets messy in terms of privacy. Yeah, yeah. So that's the yeah the trade off, I guess. The thing is, you say I, I, we are, you know, we all super, you know, Bitcoiners. We, have, we, and I with I thought, you know, it would be great if 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 a merchant like my girlfriend, you know, could could just accept Bitcoin, and then the customers don't even need to think about Bitcoin, and they're just you know paying with fiat. But she can choose whether she can be, you know, she. Uh, whether she's paid in in fiat or bitcoin but if she prefers to you know be paid in bitcoin it just transfer and then you know she won't have all these complications with the accounting system you know with her tax advisor and all that you know because it's pretty complicated and bureau bureaucratic so that was sort of the the advantage yeah. i thought you know uh, that we could pull off yeah that that is also true i can i can see why people would want to use that if you know they're they're not i mean for especially businesses, it's really hard to, to be completely anonymous as a business um, if you want to be compliant. So, yeah, that is also a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so let's 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 transition to privacy in general. How like what's the worst case scenario, uh, Shani, that that could evolve, and how can we protect ourselves on 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 any level that's been going on, recent developments, 
you know, all these uh, like like the things that's been going on with uh, with you know in the United States, the surveillance, the the, the controlling the control mechanism, like how can because people I think are so overwhelmed with uh, there are technical solutions of course, and I've you know uh, my, me and my girlfriend we we install Signal uh, for the first time, but you know hardly anyone is using it like in our you know friends or family circles so <laughs> most people are using either whatsapp and maybe telegram so could you make like a you know uh, explain a little bit the distinctions and what are the risks uh, and how worse could could it become like you know from a governmental regulatory you know whatever uh, deep state perspective <laughs> Yeah, so what happened with WhatsApp recently is, um, I mean, for anyone who didn't know, WhatsApp has been owned by Facebook for a while. Um, and actually, the amount of data sharing, it, it, I would have to read a lot more into it, but I actually don't think that the new policy is necessarily new in terms of the amount of data sharing. I think they're just trying to make it explicit um, from now on that they're doing so. Uh, so it's a bit unclear, but um, in the end, it doesn't matter. People are perceiving it as being a new change. And what happened is that WhatsApp announced that as of February 8th, um, they would be changing their privacy policy to explicitly say that they are sharing um, data with Facebook now. That date, I mean, if you trust that your messages on WhatsApp were actually encrypted, um, they're not supposed to be sharing, uh, they're, not, they're not taking away the encryption of your messages um, in WhatsApp. What they are doing is sharing, for example, your social graph, who your contact list is, um, when you message certain people. And um, as we learned from the Snowden revelations metadata, uh, well, explicitly actually from uh, intelligence people themselves, the famous line about we kill people with metadata, and he said it while he was laughing, which I don't find very hilarious, but um, yeah, metadata can actually tell a lot about a person. Um, for example, to use the uh, use case we were just talking about, um, you don't have to know exactly what someone bought at a, um, at a cannabis store. Uh, if you have a metadata record that someone was at this store and made a purchase, um, you don't have to really know anything else, especially if you're in a country that doesn't allow that or doesn't like that sort of thing. Um, that That is enough to target you. You don't need to know any more information. And that's, that's metadata. It's a location, which a lot of phones these days, they kind of ping your location to everyone and their mother. Um, with the way that these services are built, all the apps you have are probably tracking that, or most of them are. And so metadata can be really dangerous. You don't need to know the content. So just because you're encrypting the messages, um, if you're not also doing something that's metadata, if you're not using something that's also metadata resistant, or at least not sharing <laughs> metadata, um, you effectively uh, don't, have as much privacy as you think you do. Like encryption by itself is not a catch-all. It has to be designed properly. And so, yeah, a lot of people in the last couple of weeks are moving to things like Signal. Signal went from about 10 million users to uh, 50 million. So that's a 40 million wow. user increase in just a week. Um, and, you know, com in comparison to WhatsApp, uh, Signal is, I would say, definitely an improvement for people. You know, if you're using WhatsApp, that means that you probably have a phone. It means you're probably not too concerned, uh, you're not too security or privacy concerned, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so moving to Signal is definitely an improvement for the average person who is just on WhatsApp to talk to their family or friends because, um, you know, Signal is a nonprofit. There's no, there, as far as I know, there's no Facebook thing. They are based in Palo Alto, which is basically the same neighborhood. Uh, they live very close to Google. So uh, from that perspective, you know, geographically, jurisdictionally, not, not an improvement. But um, Signal uh, does not share that information with Facebook. So by, by just that baseline, you're improving by going to Signal. Um, I am personally not a big fan of Signal in general, though. Um, 
I mean, I have used it before. Like, I don't use phones in my day-to-day -day life. And if I have phones, they're rarely turned on and they're only for, you know, there are some people that are not reachable on anything except Signal or maybe will only contact me over Signal. So I have it just in case, but I don't use it in my day-to-day -day life. I don't, uh, ju just because I don't trust phones in general, I don't like using phones. So um, for that reason, I don't use Signal as my main app. I don't use any apps that require a phone number to use them. Um, just because like, I, I don't, people have this misconception that they own their phone number. And especially if you live in the US that can very easily not become, <laughs> you or you, know, you will very easily be reminded of how that's not true. If you get SIM swapped because the telecom companies are, not they're not only not very interested in <laughs> screen just went black i thought my computer went shut off um telecom companies are they they kind of i think nick zabo made this point telecom companies were not they did not design phones with the idea that they would be used as like security devices so having you know having um having your phone number be secure to you and only you is not something that they do very well. Um, a lot of their customer support are low paid. And even if, uh, sometimes even if you set up, you know, security policies, which you should do if you have a phone anyway, but sometimes those can be bypassed just because you don't own your phone. Like it's not, it's not like private keys where whoever has the key, um, there's no really private key for phone numbers that you have to control that. Um, so I don't, I don't use phones and so Signal isn't an option for me. And I also don't like things like t Telegram, which is, uh, I mean, anyone who's moving from WhatsApp to Telegram, you are, you are basically not improving. You're, you're actually making your situation worse because really? by default, yeah, I would say, I would say by default, you're probably making your situation worse. I mean, there's, as far as we know, I mean, Telegram is only, there, there's parts of it that are open source, but like the server is an open source. So who knows? They, they, you know, it could be the same thing. They could be collecting metadata about who you're contacting and sharing it with someone. And we wouldn't know because we don't know what is running on their server infrastructure. So as far as we know, they're not, they don't have a data partnership like that with Facebook or any similar company, but the, the architecture is not very different. Um, and for Telegram, it's worse on the encryption side because, um, first of all, it's turned off by default um, across the app. You have to turn it on manually. Um, and it's also only available for basically direct messages between one other you and one other user. It is not available for group chats. So if you have any group chats on Telegram, those are not encrypted. There is no way to encrypt them. It's just not, they don't do group chat encryption. Um, which, you know, WhatsApp at least, as far as we know, did that. Um, so you're actually making your situation worse. It also requires a phone number. So again, I won't use it. Basically the only way that I've ever used Telegram is through, um, a, a program called Matrix, which, um, there it's a federated system. So you can actually set up your own Matrix instance and, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's, yeah, it is on there. Um, so you can set up your own matrix instance, just like you can set up your own, you know, telegram room or whatever you can connect them to other instances. You there's also a, a, a lot of things for bridges. So you can actually bridge your matrix instance into other things. Like if you want to, uh, Slack, um, I think it also works with signal and it also works with telegram. So I'm actually in a room through matrix that connects to a telegram room of, uh, a community and so my messages when I write them through matrix get also sent to the telegram group um, through the bridge so that's the only way that I've ever used telegram and I'm aware that my messages are getting broadcast on telegram so I don't consider it very private it's basically <clears throat> just a you know it's kind of like a you know semi-private group chat um, with telegram but yeah, so I don't recommend Telegram in general. Uh, I also just, I mean, the main reason that I didn't, when, before I really knew anything about it, the main reason I didn't use it is because all I heard was about how it was full of, you know, it was very spammy. They don't do, 
I, I mean, I don't know if it's just because most people don't use them, but they don't seem to have a lot of good moderation tools. Uh, it sounds like you just, like most people have Telegram, but they don't even check it very often because they're just constantly getting spammed with messages. So that doesn't sound very interesting to me. I try to limit uh, the amount of spam that I get to preserve my attention. But uh, yeah. Yeah, you see, I mean, um, the, it, how, how technically challenging, I mean, I have, for example, a Mastodon account, but, and I try to, you know, get my Twitter, uh, my tweets on Twitter, like cross, cross posted on, on Mastodon, but I guess it's a little bit of technical challenge or I have to do something. So um, there's a, I guess a, a couple of factors that play into this because most people either don't really don't care about private or they just really don't understand the implications. So, um, and then, then there is the network effect, right? So yeah, if you, a lot of people are maybe older generations on Facebook right now, you know, and now more and more people are, are on Twitter if, with all the censorship going on. So uh, how how would you say from, from perspective of user friendliness and technical uh, technicalities, is it challenging like to, 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 you know, change a platform, like to transition to another platform? Um, yeah, I mean, I think for a lot of people that's difficult. There was, I don't know if they've solved it, but there was a very long thread on the, I think it was the Signal GitHub repo where they were talking about just being able to import the, the contact list from WhatsApp into Signal. And I guess that that's really challenging. Um, that's probably the biggest um, challenge in terms of having people migrate to a new service is like, how do I stay in contact with all the people that are on the other app? Um, and I think, I mean, the reason people are moving to Signal is because in, ter in the general scheme, it's relatively similar to WhatsApp. You know, uh, the user experience is pretty easy. So I don't think the onboarding is that difficult. It's mainly just how do I, how do I get everyone else onto it at the same time? But with, you know, 40 million people joining, um, that's, a, that's a pretty big pool. Um, and I wouldn't say that people don't care about privacy. I just feel like in, it's kind of selective and a lot, in a lot of cases, people aren't willing to change their behavior to improve their privacy if they don't think other people will go along with them. So the fact that so many people have now switched over to Signal is a good thing because it means that probably, you know, then other people who are still on WhatsApp will feel a bit better about switching if they know that that's where all their friends are going. Um, I think people just are, they're not aware of all the ways in which their privacy is broken or deficient. They're just kind of selected. I mean, so in a lot of cases, they just don't see how it's being broken. And in other cases, they're just kind of selective about willing what they're willing to do to improve it. Um, so I wouldn't say people don't care. It's just, it's hard to, uh, I mean, the internet these days, like all of these social networks are not really designed uh, to, as one former Google person put it, they're not designed to um, give you time well spent. They're, they're just designed to spend your time. Um, they want you to spend as much time using them as possible, regardless of whether it helps you be more productive, whether it helps you be a happier or more inform informed person. Um, that's that's just the nature of things. And so that's how a lot of people's brains have been uh, trained is to follow the attention getting things. And uh, it's hard to get them back onto uh, topics like privacy when that's the case. Um, so on, um, let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin, uh, Janine. Like, uh, is there anything on the, on, is there like a light at the end of the tunnel like to, you know, for for more and more people using uh, privacy tools? Would it be, uh, you know, wallets? Or would it be, you know, Samurai wallet or um, uh, coin joining, coin mixing, um, taking care more of the privacy? Is there anything that, um, that is worth mentioning? Um, I mean, lately, uh, the biggest thing is that uh, with the release, uh, the latest release of Bitcoin Core, the code for Taproot and Schnorr is now actually in the reference implementation. It hasn't been activated, so you can't actually use 
Taproot or Schnorr yet. You can only use it on Signet, which is one of the test networks. Um, but that means like, you know, the code is there now. So all it takes is um, activation. And there's a bunch of different ways of doing that that people have proposed. And I don't at this point really have an opinion on what is the best one. It's going to be a soft fork. Everyone knows that, but there's like different ways of doing that. Um, the miners, unlike with the uh, the SegWit uh, scaling debate in 2017, the miners have basically already gotten on board. Um, I think over 90% of the global hash rate has signaled that they are willing to activate um, the Taproot Schnorr soft fork in some way. Um, so that's a very that's very different from <laughs> the problems that we had uh, three four years ago. Um, so. Uh, according to, I don't, I don't, I have no idea who it was, but um, there's a project in the Monero community that's being worked on where they're trying to build atomic swaps with Bitcoin. And uh, according to their last update, someone told them that they should actually be designing the atomic swap protocol to recognize Schnorr signatures instead of ECDSA, which is what Bitcoin currently uses, the digital signature program um, or di digital signature algorithm. Um, and then Schnorr is the new one, um, and it allows for like signature aggregation, which basically just means, for example, if you have a multi-signature wallet, you have a multi-sig account with, you know, three people. When you spend from it um, with Schnorr and Taproot, you will have the option to aggregate the signatures together so that it looks like one signature instead of three. And that has the benefit of not only um, making, like it involves less data in terms of what actually appears on the blockchain, but it also gives privacy benefits because you don't know if, if you get like a very large multi-sig, which will be even easier um, with this as well. If you have, you know, a bunch of people in your multi-sig and you need, you know, a certain number of them to sign, like, let's say uh, six out of 10, whatever, whatever you want. Um, with with Schnorr and Taproot, you won't even really know who in that multi-sig actually approved the transaction sending out of the multi-sig account. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's pretty great because that means you can not only build really complex um, multi-sig stuff with uh, also the thing that Block, Blockstream is working on, like MuSig, um, but it means that you can also get some privacy. And apparently it's also possible um, related to Monero somewhat. Monero has ring signatures, which is where, you know, someone signs a transaction and you don't actually, again, kind of similar, you don't know who actually in the group um, who is, you know, actually authorizing the transaction. You don't know who signed it. Um, and apparently it's possible to do ring signatures, like a very rudimentary type of uh, ring signature with taproot outputs. So that's really great. Um, but yeah, I don't know exactly when it's going to be activated. Uh, that kind of depends on the activation route that gets chosen. Um, but I think the kind of rough timeline, like the earliest could be the end of this year. Some people are saying two years. So hopefully within the next two years, we should actually be able to use it. And then it's a question of, which wallets adopt it, how easy is it to use, uh, will it become a default to the point where you don't even know you're using it, that would be the the best option, I think, because um, a lot of people still don't even know what Taproot or Schnorr are, they don't understand why it's important, so if a lot of wallets um, and exchanges, even better, although that might be slow, because if, if the regulators hear, oh, it has privacy benefits, then they might try to stop exchanges from using it. Um, so that will be interesting to watch, but if we get a lot of adoption, that is the best um, scenario for the Schnorr Taproot soft fork because you know when more people are using a privacy feature that makes it better in terms of um, the effective privacy that it offers because you're not standing out in the crowd. Yeah, so you partially answered already the questions I wanted to ask you. So, uh, so let's assume, okay, the exchanges, uh, uh, let's say, let's just say they procrastinated, they delayed the integration or whatever because of regulatory pressure. But what if the wallets can easily, uh, you know, implement it? So 
is the advantage like not only for multi-signature but for any kind of transaction by default for any kind of user like they don't they don't even need, need to know or to notice that taproot or schnorr is being implemented right yeah i mean I, ideally they shouldn't they shouldn't have to know and the wallet would just do it by default and that is something as far as i know that is something that's possible they should you know it's just another signature scheme um like ecdsa so you know most people most people don't even most people don't even care that you know the 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 algorithm they're using to sign for their you know bitcoin transactions now is ecdsa so i don't think they're going to care that's called schnorr um and yeah so that i mean that is the the best outcome uh on the other hand if uh if a lot of other wallets besides the privacy wallets don't implement it um that just means we're back to where where we are now where if you want privacy in bitcoin you basically have to uh you have to use certain wallets that give you a lot of coin management control you have to use wallets that actually have included privacy features um like wasabi and samurai and samurai has a lot uh in, in terms of the the variety of tools samurai has a lot more they have they at this point they're basically one of the only wallets to implement paynims for example mm -hmm. which has a really interesting use case because it basically means you can um instead of publishing a regular bitcoin address like a lot of people have done you publish what is an identity and every time someone wants to send you a transaction it generates a new it generates a fresh address for that person um, and there's no, there's practically no linkage between the address that is generated for one person and the address generated for the next person or the person before them. So they can't use that to then, in, in the case where you're just publishing a regular address, you know, anyone who donates to it can see, oh, oh here's the other history of all the other donations this person got with, with the pain it's not, uh, that that is not the case and it's also not the case that um you know you you can look at the pain id but you can't see which addresses it generated you can in general there are some indicators that you can tell you know this transaction was probably using a pain because of how they have to do the notification um but other than that like it's it's an improvement for that use case um they also do things like ricochet where it lets you generate um a series of transactions in succession um which kind of slips up blockchain analysis a little bit because a lot of them kind of look a certain number of hops back when they're building their graphs um of like where coins flowed to so the more hops you add uh that kind of just makes their job a little bit harder because it means they have to either look more hops back to make their uh, kind of <laughs> data astrology predictions, because um, that's basically what it is a lot of the time. Um, or they have to um, they have to do that by default if more people do that uh, effectively, and they can't, you know, they uh, <laughs> all databases have limits, and so if everyone was just creating more transaction history, more hops, um, that would slow them down a bit. Yeah, they've done a really great job. I mean, it's also very user friendly. But uh, coming back to paynims, I mean, the transaction can only then be, I mean, uh, done if if the sender and receiver both are have a paynim, right? So correct. Um, yeah, yeah. As as far as I understand it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which you know that that would require you know you would have to use Samurai and other wallets. Uh, either you'd have to use Samurai or other wallets would have to implement a compatible um, PayNim, which I can't remember the original BIP. Uh, it's re it's actually called reusable payment codes, um, and they dubbed it a PayNim. Um, so if a different wallet wanted to be compatible with that, then they would have to um, yeah. work with Samurai, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to do a separate like a tutorial together with um, his, you know, much more technically uh, experienced, but he can break it down for, for you know, average noobs. Uh, what's it, What's his name? Economy Alchemist, uh, Burn the Bridge, also he's called on, on Twitter. So he, he does great tutorials and guides. So we're going to do a separate like uh, video or tutorial on, on the technical, you know, aspects of especially in, in connection with 
Spectre Wallet and and Samurai Watch. By the way, what's your take on on the Spectre Wallet? Did you like? Do you have the feeling of the impression like things have really advanced so fast in you know in user friendly applications, uh, software wallets, multi you know multi sig wallets, single wallet? What is your overall impression? Um, yeah, so I know about Spectre because I think uh, I. Th were they one of the wallets that added, um, can't remember if they were one of the wallets that, I mean, they recently got a donation from, uh, mm -hmm. through the, uh, human rights foundation. Exactly. Yeah. Um, they're like in terms of on the, the like privacy spectrum, I think they're more towards the middle. I don't know if they have a lot of privacy features yet. I know about them because they, um, they're in the, uh, app suite for the raspberry blitz project, which, um, it's a lightning focused uh, node hardware and software project. And I think Spectre, did they implement, um, uh, what is, I might have, I think it's in my newsletter somewhere. I think they were one of the um, wallets to implement pay join, but I can't remember. I think that might've been a different wallet. Oh, it might be a different wallet, yeah. Yeah, the thing is with, with, with Spectre is that for the first time, you know, people with their, uh, you can use, you know, you can just connect, you can just download Bitcoin Core. And I think that the long-term plan, even for Ben Kaufman in one of his interviews, I think Bitcoin Magazine said he wants to integrate Bitcoin Core into Spectre Desktop. But, you know, it's become really useful whether you have a MyNode or, you know, a no you can just connect it to your node and mm -hmm. it just create really easy, <laughs> like a single wallet, a multi-sig wallet. Uh, would it be, you know, through the Spectre app of my node or, or you, you, you know, you download, install the Spectre desktop uh, application and it's become really super, like uh, in terms of user interface, user experience, it's, it's amazing what kind of job they've done. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like, I like it because, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a good user interface for people who don't really want to look at the gritty details, but it's like, um, I, I always like wallets that, you know, if you don't want to see what's going on in the background, you don't have to look at it, but if you do, they give that option. So I think they got a good balance with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah I don't think I'm sure I thought, I, I think I got it confused with a different wallet. Um, I don't know if they have pay join. I think I confused it with a mobile wallet, but, um, yeah, I yeah you've, I, written, you've written actually something about uh, keep, keep it simple Bitcoin. You know the guy who does the keep it simple Bitcoin guides, and you mentioned something yeah. about pay join. Yeah, he did a tutorial together with Coin Kite, something like that. Um, I think well that I think that mention was just about um, how to. I think it was how to use Join Market. Yeah, exactly, Join Market. Yeah, sorry about that. I think yeah. it was. A, I think it was a guide for yeah, Join yeah. Market. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, all mixed up. Um, okay, Janine, uh, the last 15 or whatever, 20 minutes we have, um, I want to like zoom out a little bit. Like how bad could this whole situation, I mean, you know, institutions are coming in, as you can see the price, you know, of course it creates demand and, and, and volatility is part of the price discovery, price formation. And so big institutions are coming in with, with millions and probably even Elon Musk is going to come. Maybe he's doing his actual purchasing already Bitcoin in the background as, as a reserve asset. Like if you zoom, if we zoom out together a little bit, what is your overall like perspective? Like how bad can it like do central banks like uh, and, and centralized institutions, governments, nation state already feel threatened? Or do you think there's a, now, you know, competition going on, jurisdictional arbitrage, like, like positive things coming out of this whole, you know, uh, situation? Like how bad can, can this situation become? Like can, can, uh, this is a taboo question I've always been trying to discuss with people, but it just, it's, it, it's, it's being dealt with as if it didn't exist. Like we have a military industrial complex. We have a deep state. It exists. Like how bad can it be? Can it like, could they, could they pull off something like, you know, as a distraction or, uh, with, or the sheer force, you know, of their, uh, the sheer, you know, force use of the monopoly on violence, aggression, oppression, you know what I'm saying? Like, would it be in the Western countries or so-called developing countries? What is your, like, perspective on that? Um, yeah, I mean, the concerning things that, well, there was a comment from Christine Lagarde recently where she said something about how Bitcoin has been enabling funny business. I don't know if that's <laughs> the first time 
that she's ever mentioned Bitcoin because I I actually don't pay much attention to these people because they're what they say. You know, it matters in terms of the euros that I have in her case, but it doesn't matter to me much in terms of Bitcoin because she doesn't control it, which is why Bitcoin even exists in the first place uh, is to get away from the decision making, the terrible decision making of people running central banks and just banks in general uh, in a lot of cases. So, um, I mean, in in terms of Europe, it's hasn't been too harsh yet. Um, I don't know if that's because they're just not ready or uh, maybe they just don't see the point. Um, a lot of the attacks are just going to come in the form of, you know, more stringent KYC for any kind of anything connected to fiat. So exchanges, um, ATMs, uh, Oh, it, broadly, I think there's more ATMs every day uh, in Europe as a whole, but in certain countries, uh, they're kind of clamping down on that, uh, unfortunately. Um, so that's not good in terms of, you know, onboarding people in uh, ways that are somewhat private. Um, in the U.S., it's a different story because uh, over the Christmas holiday, there was this proposed rulemaking from FinCEN um, about basically expanding a new policy called uh, that's been dubbed KYCC, um, Know Your Customer's Customer, which actually so there was a guy from, I can't remember his name, but he was a former guy from the Department of Justice in the US. And he actually said that he didn't think that that was a good idea because you're basically then making non-customers um, have to, you know, give their personal information to an exchange where they're like, they're, they're not a customer. So like they have no relationship with that business and effectively then they don't really have a lot of recourse if that business then misuses their data because it was, you know, it was collected when they're not a customer. They don't have like um, a relationship or agreement to really protect it. So that wouldn't, <clears throat> that would not be a great thing. Uh, there were some other aspects to the rulemaking besides that, but <clears throat> it sounds like the U.S. government is trying to uh, make it harder for people to go between the KYC services and the not KYC services like non-custodial wallets. And they've been using this term unhosted wallet or non-hosted wallet, which is really dumb. Uh, like it, I, I <laughs> it, it really sounds like it's coming from a person that just doesn't understand how, how the internet works in general because you can have a non-custodial wallet that is hosted technically by someone else and you have the key so it's non-custodial but the the wallet inf infrastructure itself is hosted elsewhere uh you can also have a wallet that only uh only runs on your infrastructure and you're not using any third-party APIs or anything, and that is also non-custodial and it's unhosted. So the term unhosted just doesn't doesn't make sense to me. They should act. They should just use our terminology if they actually give a shit about people understanding what they want them to do in terms of regulations. But I don't think that that is the goal. I think they actually want to confuse people as much as possible. Um, so, that, yeah, they're basically trying to ramp up the uh, application of the Bank Secrecy Act, which is uh, the Patriot Act for money in the U.S., um, basically. And so that is really concerning um, for anyone who is living in the U.S. Um, luckily, in terms of the proposed rulemaking, FinCEN had a comment period and they tried to play some game where not only was their website not working correctly on Tuesdays and Thursdays, during this comment period, you had to find the, the backup website, but um, they also got the date wrong for the when the comment period would end. So it, people were not even clear like how much time they had to submit their thoughts about this. Um, but what ended up happening is because people were so pissed off that they were playing these games, they got over 7,000 comments. And they claim that they read them, but um, I don't know. I I read a lot. I don't know how many people it would take to be able to read 7,000 comments in the span of a few days over a Christmas holiday. Um, I don't know if that's that's realistic. So they might not be telling the truth about that. They might have just, you know, scanned 
through it or something. I don't know, but um, they've now extended it. So this is, and this is just proposed rulemaking and Coin Center in particular has made some comments about how they may not even have the authority to implement something like this, even if, you know, they did try to get it beyond just a proposal. So who knows what's going to happen with that. But clearly there's kind of two camps in the U.S. government. There's some people, for example, in Congress who actually wrote a letter to Mnuchin, the current uh, Secretary of State, not for much longer. Who is, who is, who is uh, like stepping... Uh, Secretary like, of Treasury. Exactly. Who is, who is uh, like his, his uh, what do you call it, his, his position is ending pretty soon. Like when is it ending? Mnuchin's... Uh, 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 basically, he's le he. Uh, a lot of people um, are leaving when Trump leaves office, which is, I believe, the twenty first. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it, interestingly, there's been, I guess, some pictures of other things leaving the White House in advance of that, like the Abe Lincoln bust or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, who knows what's going on there? Um, crazy times, but. Yeah, so Mnuchin is the Secretary of Treasury, and he is, uh, like a lot of people, leaving at the end of the administration. So kind of the the assumption is that they're trying to shove in a bunch of new regulations just before they leave office, which is annoying for a number of reasons. One, they're writing regulations that they won't even be responsible for implementing because they're leaving office. And two, they're they're rushing it, and so there's a lot less time for people to read it. There's a lot less time for people to evaluate it, and also a lot less time for it to be implemented in a way where uh, people are actually prepared to implement it. It's going to be very rushed, and uh, it's never a good thing when when new laws are rushed or new policies are rushed. So. Yeah, the U.S. is not a great situation, but um, it was interesting to see some Congress people actually writing a letter to Mnuchin, um, who, by the way, like, I find I find it so interesting that, like, you know, in Europe, you have Christine Lagarde um, leading the European Central Bank, uh, and she has effectively a criminal history. I mean, she... Yeah, she's a convicted she, uh, criminal of uh, because yeah. of uh, embezzlement, like... Uh, she, what was it? She, she was supposed to challenge the arbitration of, uh, of around 400 million euros that went to the friend of Nicolas Sarkozy. What's, what's, what's the, what's the detail story? Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't, I don't know much detail beyond that. I mean, that's, that's pretty much what I know, but the point is that, you know, she was, uh, found guilty of that. She didn't go to prison because obviously she's not one of the people who go to prison. It's not for, it's not for people like her, but I just find it interesting that you have her on one hand saying, you know, Bitcoin's enabling funny business while, you know, engaging, uh, in criminal activity in her position, abusing her authority. Uh, and then you have someone like Steve Mnuchin, who, um, I mean, there's tons of resources out there. Now, uh, Peter McCormick did a series about how much of an asshole he is uh, in terms of the financial crisis and how he profited off of people's misery. Um, so, uh, yeah, once again, the people who are claiming that, you know, Bitcoin is for criminals or there's a lot of criminals using Bitcoin media clamp down on it. Um, you know, they're... They, they don't have clean hands themselves. So, um, I mean, hopefully people will, enough people will see that and be like, why should we listen to you? I don't know why, sh why we should care what you say. Sounds but good. most likely what's going to happen is, you know, that, I mean, that's a way, that's the way a lot of these institutions work is uh, the, <laughs> they, uh, uh, they are a lot of pots calling the kettle black. Right, right. So, um, Janine, I mean, um, I don't know, uh, do you think we have come to a point um, in monetary evolution that, you know, because of the open source in nature of Bitcoin, because of its decentralization, its unconfiscatability, all these, you know, it's borderless, it's censorship resistant, it's, 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 it's you know, as, as Beautyon, what's, what's his name? I'm not sure what his real name is on Twitter, but he's written some good articles like that Bitcoin is actually... He, he always emphasizes Bitcoin is not money. Bitcoin is free speech. Bitcoin is text. So it's over, right? I mean, uh, we, we, we don't even need to fight the system or the old, you know, legacy system. It just, we create, we create, we create, and, and uh, everything else becomes hopefully, uh, you know, slowly, but gradually, and then suddenly 
obsolete, right? Is that how we do it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, uh, yeah, I think the original quote was don't, don't worry about um, fixing or changing the system, build systems that make it obsolete. Um, Buckminster Fuller. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I mean, for me, I'll, <laughs> Um, I mean, that, that's kind of when, when I was younger, I thought, you know, oh, we can change the system and make it better. And I gave up on that very early. And so that's when people say, oh, you know, you're so utopian, you think that we'll have, we'll have a world without nation states or something. And it's like, well, I don't know if we will, but I'm not going to sit around waiting for them to die. I'm yeah. going to use you know, alternative, like, th that's what I appreciate about the kind of founding philosophy of um, spaces like Parallel Polis, um, which is based on uh, kind of the Czech anarchist community where they weren't concerned about, you know, taking, ta they weren't so much concerned about, like, taking down the state or fighting the state or anything. It was about building spaces, just building spaces wherever they could, where the state was not there. Um, so not really fighting them, just, you know, building things where they could actually practically live their philosophy, even if it wasn't possible in the wider world. And I think that's, that's kind of the road that I want to go on. Um, the people who are trying to like integrate Bitcoin into the financial system or get really excited that banks are adopting Bitcoin. I mean, yeah, I guess it makes it slightly easier for people to get Bitcoin, but at the end of the day, if it's just going to be something, if Bitcoin's just going to be another asset that they hold in a bank account, then the system hasn't changed, like, fundamentally. And so I don't know if that's even a positive change at the end of the day. I think it's better if, you know, yes, we can build alternative services that kind of resemble banks, but certainly I wouldn't want to use any like I guess Goldman Sachs has recently announced that they're going to get into digital asset management and it's like great um wait so you're saying you you destroyed my wealth 10 years ago and now you want to hold my bitcoin um no thank you not interested um yeah so I'm not too enthusiastic about people especially like Michael Saylor like yeah billionaire guy who bought a bunch of bitcoin he's still a billionaire I bet he still uses all of the traditional, you know, financial system mechanisms. I bet, you know, he, he made some comments that implied he might be interested in engaging in like chain analysis, because I guess his business already does kind of market analysis as, um, as its function. And so if he does that, it's like, oh, great, wait, so we just gave a bunch of Bitcoin to a billionaire who wants to surveil us. That sounds like a great plan. I'm not a fan of people like that. So yeah, this, this kind of push to institutionalize Bitcoin is not great for me. I would rather, uh, I would rather, you know, figure out tools or build tools or help people build tools that build alternative spaces that don't have to care about these people. Yeah. And, you know, like uh, people like me, uh, billionaires or, or whatever, uh, corporate people like, like, Michael Saylor, they, they serve their role, you know, they're definitely, you know, somehow contributing in one shape or another, whether it be, you know, to adoption or to the, uh, what do you call it, like the, uh, the, the, uh, the mainstreaming of, of Bitcoin, but as, um, like I've heard of also Matt O'Dell, not really talk really positively about Michael Saylor, he said, you know, they're, you know, I think they're following each other on Twitter, but he said his comments about, like, uh, sort of, yeah, we got to go like with the regulation and we got to, you know, he, it seems Michael Sarah does not, or like many others in the, in this space, they don't understand the true objective or vision or ethos of Bitcoin. And, you know, it's not just a reserve asset. This is, this is way beyond, you know, uh, something way beyond about money. You know, this is about freedom and, and, decentralization and privacy and and uh self-sovereignty in at the end of the day so i'm not sure yeah they're all you know they're all serving the roles they're somehow beneficial but um i'm not sure whether they really uh carry within them the the torch of the ethos of bitcoin yeah um i mean related to that that's why i've always had um 
this quote in my in my Twitter bio um, in German that translates to freedom is a journey without a destination or there like there's no arrival um, in the journey and that's basically what I believe is like freedom is something you have to constantly strive for. It's not something that you just, you know, get to a certain place and now you're free. It's something you have to fight for and always keep looking for. Um, and so, yeah. All right. Janine, I really enjoyed our talk. Maybe we can repeat this sometime in the near future together again with, uh, I think the last time we talked was with Stephanie von Jan. That was mm -hmm. a great talk too. So I really appreciate what you're doing in this space. It, it, uh, your, your blogs, your newsletter, you know, the interviews you do, the, the, the podcast you do on Blog Digest. So any, any, any links or resources uh, you want to direct my listeners to? Um, I mean, I think, I think you showed the ones that uh, <laughs> I would probably direct people to. Um, yeah, and also, by the way, nice uh, background. That was, uh, I, did you use the one that was, because I think Rick, Design most of this. I don't know if you have. I think that's yeah, in a, I think a different was, it was What's his name? The, uh, the sort of designer or Sven? Is it Sven Star Fury or is it the other one? Bitcoin Meme Hub or something like that. I think he did sort of a yeah, sort of a. It was it was a limited edition stuff, and, and I think people who wanted who wanted a background like that. So I asked him. You know, I asked him, could you do that for me too? So you know, he he did it with with my picture in the background. So. Mm yeah yeah so Janine thank you so much for your time uh have a wonderful day and any other final thoughts or um uh, uh links info uh no just a uh catchphrase uh finance like no one's watching <laughs> okay gotcha <laughs> okay Janine take care and I'll see you soon hopefully again okay yeah bye bye Janine so how do you guys like that? I really enjoy talking with Janine every time. It goes really deep into the rabbit hole. So if you do care about your privacy, if you do understand and educate yourself about, you know, the implications, and there are better alternatives, there are solutions already. Would it be Signal? Would it be, you know, KYC Lite? Whatever helps to, you know, obfuscate uh, your traces or your, your data, metadata. Just, you know, uh, just, just help yourself. There are, you know, tons of people out there who can, who can help you, who can, who can educate you, um, who can inform you. So uh, Janine is really a, a, a great investigative journalist and, uh, you know, she goes really deep into the rabbit hole. So let me know if you have any questions, please follow her, follow me on Twitter, subscribe to my YouTube channel, my podcast platforms and, all we need to do is really to create, to adopt Bitcoin, to comprehend the essence, the fundamentals, the monetary technological properties of Bitcoin, at least in principle, in essence. And all we need to do is really circumvent this whole, you know, criminal legacy system uh, of central banks and IMF and, and European Central Bank and federal U.S. Federal Reserve you know, self-elected and self-appointed centralized entities that have no accountability. So without going into any rant, but the future is here. We just need to create it. And thanks so much again for support and for listening. Let me know if you have any questions, any kind of help you need, tutorial 101 or group session, maybe even in Austria, if you want to live, send me an email to hello at the totalconnector.com or kd at kvandavani.com. Uh, please give it a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and iTunes. It really helps, you know, educate more and more people, uh, whether it be in English or German-speaking communities. Thank you so much again.